Hello, good evening. Welcome for this uh, session of friends. As you know, we meet once a month between us and uh, discuss different topics. We are very honored and pleased today to have amongst us Mr. Laik Ahmed Atif, who is the president of Ahmadiyya Jamat Malta. He has been here already to give us a talk last year, if I am not mistaken. Huh? January, two years ago. Two years ago. And uh, the, um, the talk created a lot of interest on Islam. Because unfortunately, many of our differences in religion in the world is because there is lack of information of each other. And so we need, we need to hear more, to know more, and to dialogue more so that we understand each other. Because there are so many things in common in all religions that should be applied in everyday life. And we are very pleased to, to, today to hear. Mr. Kurmi have prepared a great, a great uh, deal on this uh, session. He was the liaison between us and uh, Mr. Laik. And so I leave it in his hands now to introduce the, the session. And then we'll proceed with the questions and uh, uh, the program that we have this evening. Okay, Tom. Thank you. Well, thank you, Father. As uh, Father Hillary said, uh, like we call one another by first name. He, I call him like he calls me Tony or Anthony. And uh, we've established quite a close relationship since uh, his uh, talk here two years ago. Uh, I kept in touch with him uh, by email because I was quite uh, struck by a number of articles which he wrote in uh, the local newspapers. Just to mention the titles of eight articles which he wrote since we met here, these were The Worst Creation Under Heaven, Is Religion the Cause of Unrest, Are Muslims Friends to Other Faiths, Time to Build Bridges Not Walls, Humanitarian Calamity, Death for Blasphemy, Does Islam Need the Reform, United to defeat extremism. These were the titles of all his articles. And so what I've done over the summer months, uh, on Father Hillary's suggestion, is I went through all these articles, read quite a bit about uh, the Islamic religion. I was inspired by two things, too. Uh, you remember the leaflet Father Hillary produced, The Way of Life? And on page six, I quoted this in my email to you, uh, there's a, a quotation from the Quran and a, a lovely comment and prayer. And the other thing is, I came across a book called <coughs> Meeting Islam, a, a, a Guide for Christians. Now, this is a unique book. I lent it to Father Hillary, actually, too, because I discovered that the writer of this book, who's a Christian, he's a convert in Rochester, <coughs> New York, and he got interested in the Islamic religion. The Bishop of Rochester, Rochester actually signed a unique agreement <coughs> with the Muslim community there, whereby they, they regularly meet as a community, both of them, to understand one another, as we are trying to do today. So those two things really inspired me to get going, and uh, by agreement, uh, I produced ten questions just to uh, get the discussion going. But we are going to have time at the end for anybody who wants to comment or make questions. So I'll go straight away to the core of the, of the uh, first question, the first question I chose was the, the spilling of innocent blood. Now we all know, we read the papers of the atrocities that uh, were committed over the past uh, couple of years in Nigeria, Turkey, in Belgium, and uh, in, uh, sorry, Berlin, London, Nice, <coughs> Barcelona, but even in Nigeria, Turkey, Belgium, and Pakistan itself. And uh, the problem is that uh, one wonders why these atrocities are claimed to be in the name of Islam, when uh, Islam proclaims that it is not a religion of hatred, but of love. So I uh, exchanged these uh, 
uh, cuttings even which I saw in the papers with uh, Atif and uh, his first, the first question is, is, is this why is it therefore that these things happen when innocent people are killed in the name of Allah and the interpretation which is given of Muslims in the Quran uh, is not so according to the writings of uh, uh, like so would you like to answer the first question Yes, I was Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajim, Bismillah Rahman Rahim, in the name of Allah, the most gracious, ever merciful. Uh, dear guests, friends, brothers and sisters, Assalamu Alaikum. May peace and blessings of Allah be upon you all. Uh, first of all, I would like to start uh, with thanks, sincere thanks to my dear esteemed friends, Father Henry and uh, uh, Anthony Kurmi, for inviting me here again. And I would also like to thank you, decent uh, guests who have spared time to attend this event. The question which I have been asked is a very important question. And in today's time, the prevailing violence across our societies, and particularly in Muslim uh, countries, has made to all the same people to think, and there's so much concerns about it. This prevailing violence is... Uh, due to certain reasons. First thing that Muslims has misunderstood the true concept of Islamic Jihad. And secondly, the personal interests and motives of the leaders, political or and religious, they have also fueled to that misconception and people started uh, I mean, extremism and then shedding the blood of innocent people for their motives. Jihad is an Arabic word that means to struggle and to strive for a particular objective. In the Holy Quran, when God calls upon people to engage in jihad, this refers to striving for a noble cause. This jihad can be carried out in many ways, and all of which seeks to establish peace and harmony in the society. I mean, jihad's uh, objective is not to kill people. Jihad's objective is to promote peace, harmony, and brotherhood in the society. But what we are seeing around the Muslim world, they have gone opposite to the true meaning. And this jihad could be carried out uh, through many ways. I would present you a few examples. The struggle for the self-reformation. That jihad within us as a being a human being. Because to fight our ego, our temptation for lust, for power, for greed. So that's the biggest jihad in Islam. And second is uh, conveying the true message of Islam uh, with wisdom, tolerance, respect, and harmony. And another form of Islamic jihad is spending one's wealth for the needy and for the poor to alleviate their sufferings. And one metaphorical meaning of jihad is that is a defensive battle, that when Muslims are attacked by the enemies, they should defend themselves and they should defend their religious freedom. And that's a metaphorical meaning of jihad. Otherwise, for fighting in Islam, the word kital is used. Jihad is not used for fighting, but this is metaphorically used that when you are attacked, you should defend yourself. Allah says in the Holy Quran, chapter 22, verse 40 and 41, permission to fight is given to those against whom war is made. So it's not the Muslim who has to start the war. War has been started against them, and they have given the permission to defend themselves. And this again re was reaffirmed in chapter 2, verse 191, that then fight in the cause of Allah against those who fight against you, but do not transgress. These references clearly refute the concept of any violent and forceful attacks on non-Muslims. Such attacks cannot qualify to be called jihad. As a limitation of time, I'm just giving you a gist of that. Otherwise, this topic, I could speak uh, for, for, yeah. for at least an hour or so. But I, would just, I gave you a brief understanding that what actually jihad is and what is seen around the Muslim world, that is not the true jihad. The second part of the question was regarding, uh, I think uh, my friend has uh, forgot to mention, regarding the new interpretation of the Quran. That it was uh, uh, one scholar, uh, Islamic scholar was uh, quoted, that he said that there is need of a new interpretation of Quran to counter extremism. So, as far as the interpretation of the Holy Quran is concerned, there's always a possibility to explain and elaborate the teachings of the Holy Quran. 
The Holy Quran is a living book. It is an ever-running stream that provides spiritual water and guidance at every time. The unlimited beauties of the Quran with its countless treasures of wisdom and knowledge keep on manifesting themselves in every age according to the need of the time. So this is actually a miracle of, his, the, of the Quran. That Quran was revealed, but the meanings and understanding and interpretation according to the times and according to the needs, the scholars, the, the, the divinely guided uh, people, they elaborate on those. And whenever there's a need, Quran provides guidance on that matter. So uh, elaborating Quran and uh, giving interpretation to Quran is always open. However, the question arises that which commentary would be valid and who has the authority to lead that, uh, uh, that, uh, that uh, interpretation, united interpretation of the Quran. With having a degree as an imam or knowing the Arabic language does not qualify a man to understand the profound wisdom of the Quran. Because in the very beginning of the Quran, Allah says that this Quran is a perfect book. There's no doubt in it. It is a guidance for the righteous. It's not, I mean, anybody who reads the Quran, who knows Arabic, has a degree, etc. He could uh, get all the profound wisdom. But to get the true understanding and profound wisdom of the teaching of the Quran, a person must be righteous. He would has love of God in his heart. He must be loving the mankind. So then he can get the right message. All right, Shambhi, then, because you've gone on to the second one, have you? Yes. Okay. Yes, in actual fact, uh, Light has already gone on to part of the second question, because the second question was this. In one of his articles, he actually quoted the fact, this question of the interpretation. And the question I intended putting to him is that, isn't there a problem in the, in the Islamic religion that the various imams give their different interpretation to the Quran? Uh, um, he himself, uh, in one of his articles, said that the problem is that in the Muslim religious schools, are becoming nurseries of extremism. I mean, we know that. that uh, this is where the terrorists come out of, from when, the, when, uh, when they are taught the extreme ends. And, and he went on to say, no one should be allowed to use places of worship and religious schools to preach hatred, violence, and extremism. So the point is, uh, is there some central authority, which doesn't appear to be, in the Muslim religion, where there can be, uh, you know, rules for these imams, because everybody seems to be free to make his own interpretation. To make a comparison with the Catholic Church, I mean, you know, the Pope is the extreme, is the is the top authority in the interpretation of the Bible and all the rest. So, don't you feel that that there is a a, a bit of a vacuum there? Uh, no, actually, there's there's not a vacuum. There is. As I was elaborating that there is to interpret the Quran, we need a divinely guided person because human beings do make mistakes while interpreting the Quran. And uh, Allah the Almighty, when he sent the Holy Prophet Muhammad as a messenger, he foretold him the, all the scenario that a time will come that when Islam will not remain as a true Islam, Muslim will, mean, will not remain a true Muslim in letter and spirit, and the Quran will be read but it will not go under their throats. It means they will be just reading the words, but the message will not be adopted. They will not practice Islamic teaching. And then he said at that time, Allah the Almighty will send the promised Messiah and Mahdi, Mahdi means a guided one, and he will come as a reformer and he will reform the Islamic teachings. And that promised Messiah, we believe, that has come. The founder of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community who proclaimed to be that awaited Messiah uh, whose advent was foretold by the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And he led that reformation, that revival of Islam. And he gave a very heart-touching interpretation of the Quran. I mean, those articles which my friend is mentioning, I mean, if you read those articles, these are not my insight. These are the understanding which we were given by that ref reformer of this time. But other Muslims are not believing in him because... According to the history, history I say that history repeats itself, as the Messiah after Prophet Moses, Messiah, the Jesus Christ, peace be on them, 
when he came to the world, people did not accept him. They, they refused him. They said, no, you are not the Messiah we were waiting for. Similarly, the Messiah after the prophet Muhammad, who was, uh, whose uh, advent was foretold, when he came and he said that I am the same Messiah whose advent was foretold by the founder of Islam, majority of Muslims or the largest number of the Muslims, they rejected him. They said, no, you are not that Messiah. We are meeting that, this, that. So they started bringing new things, new theories that we are, uh, we, and they, uh, the bottom line is, they rejected that. That's why there is, after the, after the promised Messiah, there is a, a system of caliphate, successorship in Islam, and uh, in Ahmad, our community, now we are in the time of fifth uh, caliph. So whenever there any issue arises, there is, if there is any problem about the interpretation of the Quran, they are leading that. And the caliph has the central authority as the Pope has in the Catholic Church. So we, the Ahmadiyya Muslim community, we are blessed, we are fortunate because we believed in the promised Messiah of the time. And we also now, after his demise, there are a system of uh, caliphate, which is the source of true understanding of Islam. So there is a central authority of the interpretation of Islam, of the Quran. But other Muslims, they are not lending their ears to hear that. And as long as they will not hear this divine voice, their situation will remain desperate, or it is getting from bad to worse. Because there's no leadership. There's no, so there's no one to guide them. I can quote one incident, one, that once a Turkish Muslim, he attended the annual convention of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community in UK. And after listening to the faith-inspiring speeches of the head of our community, he started crying and said that the Ahmadis, you are so fortunate that you have a body and a head. He meant that body means the community and head means the spiritual leader. And he said that the other Muslim world, they have a body, but they do not have a head. So how could a body without a head, it can survive or remain on the right path and right direction? So I think that story speaks volumes, that the Muslim world is in dire need of true and divine leadership. But God, who is so merciful, who is so gracious, he has provided that, guy, that leadership, but it's our duty, the Muslims, to lend our ears, to submit ourselves to that leadership, to get true understanding of the faith of the Quran. And I, 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 I assure you on full authority that if the Muslim world will lend their ears, their situation will change. Their situation from this desperate situation, from this horrific incidents which we see in every day, and you can name any country, Syria, Libya, Afghanistan, Pakistan, what's happening around the world? This will change. But this cannot change by rejecting the divine voice. It will change to, by accepting the divine voice. The mistake was made, I mean today, after 2000 years, still there are people who do not believe in Jesus Christ as a Messiah. They're saying still they do not believe him, the same Messiah who was supposed to come. The same mistake is our Muslims are doing. They say, no, the Messiah who has come, he's not that Messiah which we are waiting for. But they do not learn the lesson from the history. After 2000 years, still people are waiting for the Messiah after Moses, who came, who preached, he gave a wonderful message, but still people are waiting. So Muslims are committing the same mistake. So the bottom line for us, the Muslim is to hear that divine voice and lend our ears, submit to that divine leadership. And then the new interpretation is available on any issue. I mean, you can name any issue in this world. Our leadership, the promised the promise, uh, uh, Messiah, and after him, the caliphs, they are providing us guidance on every moment, on every issue, on every problem. Or I should say that there is remedy for every problem. Yeah. Well, as a matter of fact, uh, when the 
Like was here two years ago, remember? He, he actually gave us a, a book of the writings of the leader of the Ahmadiyya. And I think when one reads this, one has no doubt whatsoever that the interpretation of the Ahmadiyya is quite different to the interpretation of the extremists. So on that, I think one, one is convinced. Uh, the problem remains, I think, that from what I've read then, and including in your own articles, for example, you mentioned, which I, I hadn't come across in any book, is that the, uh, when the Prophet Muhammad migrated to Medina, he actually signed a charter with Jews and Christians, because they are mentioned in the, in the Quran, to live with mutual sympathy and sincerity, and that they would refrain from oppression against each other. I mean, so if that charter existed, uh, we don't hear of that charter anymore. Why, why, why isn't this charter, you know, more diffused than the, in the, in the uh, Muslim world? Yes, when the Prophet Muhammad, he migrated to Medina, and there, as he was uh, a leader for the Muslims, he, because he's a prophet for Muslims, but the all other communities who were living there, they were Jews, pagans, other communities, idolaters, I mean, all the people who were living there, they also accepted him as leader and the head of the state. So he wrote a charter, and he, in that charter, he addressed all those citizens. And he said that all the citizens will be equally treated. They will be citizens of this state of Medina. As far as religious issues are concerned, everybody is free to preach, practice his faith. But in front of the state, all citizens will be dealt equally. And that charter which he signed with different uh, communities who were living there in Medina. So that is the first const written human constitution. But the Muslims, they are not even reading those. They are not even following those uh, rules and regulation. There it was clearly written that every person would be free to preach, believe and practice his faith. And no, if, they, if the enemies will attack, we all together will defend ourselves. If the I mean, enemies are attacking Jews, for example, or Christians or pagans, all members, all communities together will defend themselves. It, does, it does not mean that if the attack is on Jews, other community will set aside and they let them uh, defend. No, it was that if the Medina, the state of Medina is attacked by the enemies, we all together will defend. So that was the charter. I think if Muslim world just uh, brings out that charter, read them and uh, make a part of their constitution, there will not be problems as well because that charter is a very strong charter. And it, the Holy Prophet said that this charter should remain forever. It was not just for the time being. Right. As a matter of fact, what I fail to mention is that the book makes it clear here that the, the motto of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community is love for all, hatred for none. That is the, 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 the motto of uh, Likes community. Now we'll come to another question. When you commented on the human calamity with specific reference to the long-drawn Syrian conflict, you stated that the Holy Quran repeatedly condemns war, declaring it a catastrophic fire. Moreover, you stated that the international community, particularly the neighboring Muslim countries, should play a vital role in extinguishing this fire of hatred and stop vested interest and thirst for power which have caused mass destruction and shattered and ruined the entire country. We've seen it now, how Syria is really completely finished. Now I know this is all due to ISIS, but when ISIS really started the battle, they were not, uh, nobody had attacked them first, but they decided to form this caliphate again. Isn't that the reason? Yes, the issue is that uh First of all, I think you would agree with me that certain extremist organizations, sometimes they are planted by some world powers for their, oh. for their interests. And sometimes the unjustly interventions, they fuel and they give uh, strength to these organizations. Because uh, when certain injustices occur, 
then these uh, extremist organizations, they take advantage and then they exploit ignorant people and uh, they exploit them for their personal interest and uh, gain. So ISIS is one of those uh, organizations and then they used, brought the name of religion inside and they said that now because it's easy to exploit people with the name of religion. But as far as Islam is concerned, there is no space of such atrocities and violence, etc. And one thing I would also I would like to ask is to tell my dear guests that these organizations, their actions should be judged according to Islamic teachings, and not the Islamic teachings be judged according to their actions. If they are doing bad, so that's their fault, and we have to check according to Islamic teachings. That does Islam permit them or not? And I can tell you on authority, Islam does not permit any kind of, uh, I mean, extremism and uh, terrorism, what they are committing. Secondly, the concept of uh, caliphate, of ISIS, it's very flawed, it's faulty. And uh, the Islamic caliphate is not the symbol of terror or fear, but the true Islamic caliphate, beyond any doubt, is a source of peace, unity and brotherhood. Caliphate cannot be established as someone may like. Caliphate is an institution established after the prophethood. In Arabic, Khalifa, the Caliph means successor or deputy. And the Caliphate is the dominion of Khalifa or the institution that runs under the leadership of Caliph. So who does the Caliphate of Abu Bakr Baghdadi, the leader of ISIS, represents? No one. So he cannot be called Khalifa, according to Islamic teachings. Khalifa comes after the Prophet. So who is Prophet he is succeeding? No one. So first thing, this is the first point that this, this is a faulty concept. Second, let me quote you from the Holy Quran that what Quran says about this subject. Quran says, Allah has promised those among you who believe and do good works that he will surely make them successors in the earth. And he has made, as he has made successor for those who were before them. Uh, let me read it again. Allah has promised to those among you who believe and do good works that he will surely make them successors in the earth as he has made successor from those who were before them and that he will surely give them in exchange security and peace after their fear. So just focus that God promised to those who believe and do good deeds that they will be given caliphate. ISIS, their actions are not good deeds, they are stanic actions, they are evil deeds. So how could those people who are representing satanic actions will be given caliphate? Secondly, the caliphate in exchange of God says that he will give them security and peace. But their actions are more horrific so there's you can't see any peace over there so it means that the concept of caliphate is faulty that's not true according to islamic teaching and thirdly that why this isis is remaining there the issue is the muslim countries are not playing their role quran clearly mentions that if certain things do occur, do take place, Muslims must unite and to counter that problem. And I would quote from the Holy Quran, it says that if two parties of believers fight against each other, make peace between them. Then if after that one of them transgresses against the other, fight the party that, that transgresses until it returns to the command of Allah. Then if it returns, make peace between them with equity and act justly. So when the Muslims were seeing that ISIS is taking place, they are fighting mostly between Muslims, they are killing them, and then their activities have now expanded to other countries. So Muslims should have immediately united and fight that. But unfortunately, as I earlier mentioned, there's no leadership to guide them. There's no divinely leadership 
for them to guide them to bring them to the and uh, tell them the right understanding of Quran that's why they are not playing the role and that's why ISIS is, is still there right the next point is the blasphemy the accusation of blasphemy now I do I drew your attention to the fact that even in Pakistan there was a university student who was murdered on baseless accusations of blasphemy. Uh, you made some very categoric statements in your, in your articles. Uh, again, you referred to the fact that unfortunately there are both truthful and good scholars, and on the other hand, un untrustworthy and dishonest scholars, as you already uh, explained. Now, what struck me too is that you made the statement I have read the Quran numerous times and failed to find a single verse or part of a verse which declares blasphemy to be a crime punishable by human beings. Can you expand on that? Exactly, because uh, blasphemy is an action against God, his religion and his prophet. So in Islamic teachings, the laws are divided into two laws or matters related to human beings and matter related to God. And there, when matters are related to human beings, God does speak about worldly punishments because these are worldly matters with the human being. When it comes to religion, the punishment or reward of, of everything, of every action, lies in the hands of God. And human beings has no authority to go into that domain, the domain of God. So in worldly matters, God has given us a guidance, but when there's domain of God, there's no worldly punishment prescribed. Shall we move to the next one? Or uh, no, I'm, I'm going to elaborate more. Okay, fine. Okay. Uh, as far as the punishment of blasphemy is concerned, there's no doubt that blasphemy is the most repugnant, dis distasteful, and loathsome act which touches on the sensitivities of all decent minded believing people. No matter which faith one belongs to, any violation by words or deeds of the sanctity of God or his chosen messengers is considered deeply offensive. In fact, Islam condemns every form of blasphemy. The use of abusive and filthy language cannot be permitted against any human being. So how could it be acceptable against religion divine messengers and against God. However, there is no physical worldly punishment prescribed for blasphemy in Islam whatsoever. The question arises that then how Muslims should respond when they are faced with such situation. God instructs Muslims in the Holy Quran and says that when you hear the signs of Allah being denied and mocked at, sit not with them until they engage in a talk other than that for in that case, you would be like them. So this is the only response the Muslim need to give, that if they find that there is uh, blasphemy taking place, some bad words against God, his religion, his pro prophets is being, are being said. So Muslims are asked that you should boycott that sitting. But only, if, not permanently, for as for the time being, they change their talk. If they stop that bad words, blasphemy actions, you can go again and sit with them. So there's, I mean, this verse again speaks volumes. That that uh, boycott is not even permanent, just for the time being. If they change their course, then you may go and talk and sit with them. So no punishment is prescribed. Yes, what the punishment God would give to them, that lies in the God's hand. And then he will judge in the day of judgment. That's not our duty to go into that domain, the domain of God. And here I would also like to mention, because uh, some people say that the love of Prophet Muhammad and they are doing, if they cannot bear it if somebody says blasphemy. I personally, as a Muslim, if I tell you, that Prophet Muhammad is my romance, romance for life. I love him truly. Not only me, that's what we teach our children, 
that all Muslims must be having. And as a Muslim, I truly love Prophet Muhammad. But then, issue is, what is the true meaning of love? And love for the Prophet Muhammad has been taught to us in the Quran. Allah says that if you want to love God, you must love this Prophet and follow his teachings and his guidance so you reach God. And the founder of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community, he taught the love for the Prophet Muhammad. He said, I will quote his one verse. He says, that's a Persian. Badaz khuda ba ishke Muhammad mukhammaram gar kufr ee bawad ba khuda sakht kafiram. It says that after God, I'm in abbreviated with the love of Muhammad, peace be on him. And if this is infidelity, then by God, I'm a great infidel. So that after God, my love is for the Prophet Muhammad. That love we Ahmadi Muslims has been taught. He, the love for the Prophet Muhammad is deeply rooted in us. It is ingrained in our minds. But what does true love mean? True love does not mean that if we see something bad happening, we respond bad with the bad. We kill people. We... Uh, accuse people for blasphemy for personal interest and we demand that these people must be hanged and killed and as long they will not be killed or hanged our our heart will not find satisfaction that's the wrong interpretation of the love of the prophet muhammad the true love of the prophet muhammad is that the muslims we all believe in the teachings what he brought and practice them in our daily life that is true love. I will mention you very briefly that nowadays in Pakistan, in Islamabad, there is a sit-in by a religious organization. It's called Labaik Ya Rasulullah. That, oh, Prophet, we are here for your service. And that, I mean, there was a change, a little amendment in the law of Pakistan in the, uh, in, in the nomination paper for the election. So they changed that before it was that whoever wants to I mean, apply for the election, he must declare a, a, a paper that he believes the Prophet Muhammad, he solemnly believes and declares the Prophet Muhammad is the last and no prophet can come after him. And the amendment they made a bit that I declare, I mean they just took the word solemnly and then it came, uh, it was politicized and the religious leaders they came in and... Uh, it, they made a big fuss. And one religious organization now having a sit-in in the capital of Pakistan. They have blocked all the roads and etc. And they want that who the, the minister who of law, he must be sacked. And some are asking that these people would be hanged, should be this and that. The many, many things they are, whatever is coming in their, their mind, they are saying. And then they are declaring that this is doing for the love of the Prophet Muhammad. They are using very abusive language. I mean, we can't hear them. And on sometimes on television, they are speaking bad on, against media, our uh, courts, people, public. And they are using such a bad language, which is not even acceptable from a, a, from a person in the street. And they are the scholars. They are saying that we are the scholars of Islam. And if you hear their language, it's very abusive and filthy language. Let me, uh, I'm taking a bit of time, but let me, uh, uh -huh. yeah. let me elaborate more that the Prophet Muhammad, he actually guides that give roads their rights, meaning do not block the roads. And these people who are sitting there, they have blocked the roads. No ambulance can pass. Uh, students cannot go to their schools. People cannot go to the work. And uh, the mess they have created, if you just go and just see on the television, it's horrible. All the capital has been jammed. The state cannot function freely. And Quran says that you must obey your authority, that the government must be obeyed. No rebellion should be against the government of the time. If you want to bring change, that should be with dialogue, not blocking the capital. And then the Prophet Muhammad, he says that a Muslim army, even during wars, he said that a Muslim army should not camp in a place where it causes inconvenience to the general public. 
when it marches it should take care not to block the road nor cause discomfort to the travelers then he said that uh, the prophet was so ins insistent on these rules for a fighting army that he declared that whoever did not observe these rules he will be fighting for himself not for the sake of god i mean even during the time of war it was not allowed for muslims to block the roads or block somebody's door or disturb the people so let alone these people there's no war in pakistan and they have blocked the roads and they have jammed the capital is this is the true love for the prophet absolutely not but in actual term this is the blasphemy what they are doing they they started fight against blasphemy but actually they are committing the blasphemy because they are doing what prophet did not ask them to do which he said that you should not be doing that so that is true that is in actual terms a blasphemy so you are seeing that how the negative approach is going on what they are asked to do they are not doing and what they are asked not to do they are committing those mistakes Yes, I'm going to skip a couple of questions. Suppose we need to move ahead to, to give an uh, opportunity for questions from the floor. Now, a very topical thing is, and we have some ladies with us here, is the woman's inferiority uh, as defined in the Quran. I mean, we know that according to the Quran, the husband can repudiate his wife, but not vice versa. But the husband has absolute authority over his wife, which renders the wife an object rather than a human being. Polygamy is allowed by the husband, but not by the wife. And the Muslim marry, uh, woman may not marry a man of a different faith. But a Muslim man may take a wife, or even up to four wives, according to the Quran, uh, of another religion. Now, on the other hand, you know what the Christian uh, concept uh, is, that a man and a woman are substantially on the same level. So, in your view, how can the Muslims continue to justify these principles that consider women inferior to men and also now that you have lived in Malta for a few years do you feel influenced at all by the Christian conception of the status of the two sexes? I mean this question in itself there are plenty of questions so I think just to address this question in detail uh, well, in detail this will this yeah. this this needs uh, another <laughs> even like that but I will briefly touch to these questions uh, but if I mean uh, this question in at length, if sometime you like, I will always at your disposal. But this question, we'll do it briefly because yes, we'll then, we'll here I would like to uh, that this is to me it's a misconception that the husband has full authority over the wife, and uh, uh, because uh, Islam gives both to men uh, and women the right to marry the person of their choice, and if there are unsolvable disputes they both have the right to divorce so it's not particularly what man has and woman both have those rights but there is one exception in those rights the islam says let me read this verse and they the women have rights similar to those of men over them in equity but men have a rank above them and allah is mighty and wise islam gives extreme importance to the family life and adopts measures to ensure that the family remains intact. Women in Islam enjoy equal rights in social field and in matters of religion. But the smooth running, for the smooth running of family life, man has been made the head of the household and in, the, in that sense placed above the women. If that distinction were not there, discord and perpetual bickering in family life were bound to follow. It is a simple logic that every organization, every country, every NGO, every institute has a head. So husband has been made the head of the family. So the mutual, mutually they can discuss, they can talk, and husband has been given the authority to take a final decision. As you can, any organization, they discuss matters, and then the head of the, uh, the organization takes the decision. Similarly, otherwise, uh, man has not been given absolute authority over woman. Absolutely, that's not the case. Then another verse is presented in this case that men are guardian over women because Allah has made some of them excel others 
and because they men spend on them of their wealth. In this verse, the Arabic words kawam, guardian, does not mean ruler or governor, or the one which has absolutely absolute authoritative power. Guardian over women only means that the men are the managers of the affairs of women or that they undertake the maintenance of women. There was about the, about the polygamy. Yes, Islam does permit polygamy, but it does not encourage it. Because, and then it also makes conditions of fair and just treatment. Allah says in the Quran, but if you feel you may not be able to deal justly between them, then marry only one. And again, Islam was the only religion which restricted the number of marriages. Before Islam, there was not that kind of restrictions. People used to marry as many wives they would like. There was no restriction and Islam did not increase the number of wives, but it restricted, decreased. And in certain uh, tribes, certain people, people used to have 50 wives, 30 wives, 40, there was no restriction. But Islam said no. And he brought the number from 40, 50 to 4, and then it has said that it's with the condition of justice and fair treatment. And say that if you can't be fair, if you can't do justice, then only one. If a man cannot be satisfied with one woman, it is better for society that he assumes full moral and financial responsibility for a second one. Having a mistress and committing adultery is a grievous sin and causes moral decline of society. Polygamy becomes a necessity under certain circumstances, but can only be practiced under certain conditions and then with restrictions. A man can marry again if his wife is chronically ill and cannot fulfill the obligations of marriage, or if she is unable to have children, or under certain conditions of wartime, when marrying widows to provide for orphans may be necessary to protect the moral of society. Regarding polyandry, that Islam does not permit, permit women to marry more than one husband, because it's not practicable. Just imagine that if a husband has four wives and four wives each has four husbands, how big the family would be? If that can be conceivable, is that big family can, is manageable? Not. And then if we know if the person, one man has four wives, the children will be easily identifiable that this child belongs to that mother. But in other case, if the wife has four husbands, who the ch children would be? And if you, somebody presents the argument of that today in the scientific world, we have the DNA test and we can easily identify the ch child. The issue is Islam is a living religion and it's for all times. This DNA testing is just is invention of recent times. But Islam came to the world in 1400 years ago. And even today, there are many, many communities and uh, nations who, do not, who cannot afford these testings. They do not have these kind of uh, scientific uh, advancements. Because if they have money, they will go to buy some food because there's so much hunger and there's poverty. So these are, this actually, this concept is not practicable. And Islam says that when man marries more women, actually Islam puts responsibility, financially and moral, that he should be, because in Islam, uh, food, clothing, shelter, all the expenses of the family is on the husband. So when a husband marries more, it's not that he's being relaxed. He's putting a lot of responsibility on his shoulders. And that's again, if we go into deep, deep the profound uh, wisdom of this uh, uh, permission, it come, becomes very beautiful that actually in the end, it's a service to women as well. That Islam does not say that women should be neglected and left. Islam says that even if there is a war, many women have, because mostly the men, they go for fighting and uh, they are killed. So we, women live in larger number. So Islam says that those who could not find their mate, so they do deserve respect. So they should not be neglected, but men should bring them in their houses with respect, 
dignity and provide their uh, needs and then marry with them. So marrying more women is putting extra responsibility on, hus on a man. And then the Quran says, if you cannot be fair and just, then it's not allowed. Uh, Uh, then it, I was asked that uh, uh, why a Muslim woman cannot marry someone from the other faith. Uh, it's, it, Islam makes it clear whom a Muslim is allowed to marry as far as his or her religion is concerned. Marriage with an idolater is totally forbidden in Islam for both men and women. However, men are allowed to marry women of the people of the book, meaning Christians and Jews. It should also be remembered that the, both the Quran and the sayings of the Prophet Muhammad hint that the permission to marry women from Jews and Christians is given as an exception due to certain circumstances and needs. However, generally it is encouraged that Muslims, Muslim men should marry Muslim women and Muslim women should marry Muslim men. The reasoning behind this is very sound. A woman is not permitted to marry outside her faith because when she is in her husband's home and environment, she and her children are exposed to non-Muslim culture and practices. This makes it very difficult for her to remain steadfast in her own faith and bring up her children as Muslims. Moreover, it is to save contradictions in everyday life and contradictions of upbringing the children later on. That's why Islam does not permit Muslim women to marry outside the Islamic faith. Because the diversity of faith and mental outlook and clash of concepts may lead to mutual bickering and consequently deprive the couple of the true happiness of married life, thus defeating the objective of Islamic, uh, Islamic marriage. The cornerstone of all these teachings is to strengthen the institution of marriage and immune it from the contradictions, quarrels, and conflicts. So the family life, so the families live happily and peacefully and making their houses, and they make their houses an abode of peace and prosperity. After answering this question, I would briefly, I would like to also elaborate that what kind of rights Islam gives to women, as a woman, as a wife. Uh, the Quran clearly states that consort with your wives in kindness. This is imperative on every Muslim husband, that he must consort, deal, treat his wife with kindness. And then the Quran says that if you dislike them, it may be that you dislike a thing wherein Allah has placed much good. The Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu said, said, the best among you is he who is the best in his treatment of his wife. Another, at another occasion he said, the best among you is he who is best in the treatment of his wife. The more a man is good to his wife, the greater shall be his value before Allah. On his last pilgrimage, the last address of the prophet before his demise, he, he pinpointed some very important points because that was his final address. And particularly about women, he said, be kind to women. It is your duty to take very good care of them and provide for all their necessities and treat them with kindness and courtesy. Once a companion of the Prophet Muhammad, he came to Prophet and asked that, O Prophet of Allah, please define for us the rights of our wives. The Prophet said, provide for them all their needs and show no meanness and unkindness in fulfilling their reasonable demands. Then the Prophet said that if a believer puts a morsel in the mouth of his wife out of love, Allah will reward for him. I mean, putting a piece of bread in the mouth of the wife in to, in to show respect and love, the Prophet said, God will even reward you for that minor action. And actually he was saying that women are so important that you must be careful to such extent that do not ignore even minor things. Be sensitive to their needs and to their happiness that go down and 
do everything possible to make your wives happy because you will be having a, a lot of reward. Yeah. Yes. No, okay. I now realize, of course, uh, I'm skipping the other questions because otherwise we won't have time for questions from the floor. Uh, that, as uh, like said, that this question of women uh, takes a whole se could take a whole session. I had a lot to say. Uh, when I put this question, I thought it was quite a, a topical one and one should be raised. So, but I think I think we should now give the opportunity to anybody from the floor who would like to make a comment or ask for additional information or even raise another question. Otherwise, we won't be fair to the audience. I did promise them that we would be certainly not saying later than quarter to nine, so we have another 15 minutes. Uh, if you want to take the time, whoever wants to make a comment or ask a question. Peter. You mentioned that um, what's happening is that in the schools, the children are being taught something different to what is written in the Quran. And they're being taught to react, to go into war, and all that sort of thing. Now, certainly the best people to counteract this are the parents of the children. But what is happening then? Are the parents condoning the situation and maybe even encouraging it? Or should they really be coming out clean and saying, we do not accept that our children are taught this kind of religion, which is not the Quran. You don't see anything about this in the news, that anybody is taking action against these teachers who are extremists and who are turning all these children into potential extremists themselves. I think the bottom line is that if there is no leadership, who will guide them? In, uh, in Ahmadiyya Muslim community, who the people who we believe in the reformer of the latter days, in our community, you will not find a single person who is extremist, who is radicalized. Yeah. Yeah. Because from the very early age, we teach our children values of decency, tolerance, acceptance, harmony, and living in diverse society. Those values we teach them from the very early beginning. We do not teach our children that, as some people say, that we are the chosen one. No. We never teach these kind of things. Because the Quran does not say these things. And if you're saying that in school certain things are taught, the leaders, they are, they have, have the, the Islamic scholars have prepared those, that kind of Islamic slippers. If they are not clear in their mind, I mean, what, what would they will be giving uh, to, the, to, the, to the nation? It is simple. Once a Pakistani uh, uh, journalist, he, oh, he, he gives particularly example, he said that if you are putting a meat of cow and you make mince and in the machine, from other side, the mince of cow, the meat of cow will become a mince. You can't say you are putting a cow and from other side it will come the chicken. So what you are feeding, that what, what you, what you uh, sow, that what you reap. The problem lies very much I think, with the madaras, isn't it, where you, the teacher is rather than at home too. But then we know that the Ahmadiyya teach a different uh, kind of way. John. Uh, if I, if I may, there seems to be a major split within the Muslim world between the Sunnis and the uh, Shiites, as it is typified by the conflict which is evolving between Iran and Saudi Arabia. And uh, I feel that this is shaking the Muslim world tremendously. Can you explain a bit more about Ahmadiyya and where you stand within the Muslim world and how you differ from the Shiites and the, and the Sunnis, if at all? Yes, as I earlier mentioned, that the biggest difference is that we believe that the reformer who was prophesied, he has come. Others, they are waiting. They are saying he will come. So that's the biggest difference. As far as the Ahmadiyya Muslim community is concerned, we are in every matter, let's say, uh, living in a, uh, in, a, in a Christian state, I mean, where the majority of people are Christian, although the government is secular, how we need to react? Do, are we here to raise our voices against the government, against people? No. So in our, there's huge reformation every every aspect of life, 
every issue you raise, you will find the difference. As you have mentioned that recently what's going on between Shia and Sunni and uh, new blocks are being made against, like say, Saudi Arabia and Iran. We are Ahmadis, we are playing a positive role in that, that we, our leader is guiding them. That the road you are leading is a road of destruction. Do not try to uh, build walls and uh, give space to more uh, fightings, rather build bridges. If you have difference of opinion, no problem. Even at, in one home, two, four, five people are living, everybody has a difference of opinion. Do we fight within a, in our families? No. Similarly, what Islam says, that if there is a difference of opinion between Muslims, they should not tell that I am the right and you are the wrong. They should discuss, they should dialogue, but they should not impose what's happening. So the Arabia wants to impose its way of thinking about Islam. Shia, they say, because we are in power in our area, so we sh should be the, the, the main game changer. But Islam says, if somebody believes in Islam and he proclaims, he declares that he's a Muslim, no one has authority to declare him that, oh no, you are no Muslim. So that's the fight. Actually, this is the fight of uh, power. It's not fight for Islam. Because this fight, again, will give a lot of loss to Islam. And that's what's happening in the last centuries, that the fight between Shia and Sunni, who suffers the most? Islam. But is Ahmadiyya a sect? Is Ahmadiyya a sect? It's, it's, a, it's, it's a denomination, but it's, it's the denomination because Sunni and Shia, and there are many, uh, I, I will give you a, a quotation from the saying of the Prophet Muhammad. He said that there will come a time that my ummah, the, my people, will be divided like the Israelites, that they were divided in 72 different sects. My people will be divided into 73. He said the 72 would be on the wrong side and 73rd would be on the right side. So in Islam, there is so much division. And only that division can be uh, bridged through a divine voice. Otherwise, there have been so many efforts by the Muslims, some scholars for the caliphate, for unity, for this and that. But they all remained uh, uh, futile. Because the reason is, unity cannot be gained by people. Unity can only come under a divine voice. Because those people who, are, who were trying to unite, they were not clear in themselves. Because if the Sunni want to de unite, they, they, they are not comfortable sitting with the Shia. How would they bring unity? And then within Sunnis, there are so many other sects. And within Shia, there are so many in other sects. But the difference is Ahmadiyya is not a sect or denomination that we just we had a different opinion and another denomination the community started. No, that's not the case. Ahmadiyya Muslim community, we believe that we are the true representative of Islam because we believe in the final reformer. We believe in the promised reformer who was prophesied by the Prophet Muhammad. And he was so, uh, he, so he emphasized so much that when you find the time of the promised Messiah and Mahdi, even if you have to go through the mountains, even the way is hard. They are, I mean, ice covered, has covered the mountain. You can't walk. You need, you, you need to crawl. Even then, you must go and believe in that promised Messiah and give my regards to him. Say my salam to him. Because he knew that only divine uh, uh, person can unite. That's why our community is in more than 200 countries. Our leader says one thing, it is all over the, across the globe, we follow it. Whenever there crisis arise in, in the world, I mean, lately there, were, there was a, a film against the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, and it was very embarrassing, very painful for us. But how the other Muslim reacted and how we reacted, there's a huge difference. Because there every leader, every imam, I can tell you that even in Pakistan, I'm, uh, I, I, I used to witness, if in one street there are three, four mosques, every mosque would be different from others. 
everybody will be saying different things in one street and let alone one country and the entire world. So in Ahmadiyya Muslim community, there's a huge check and balance. Even if a person wants to interpret any verse of the Quran, or if he wants to bring any particular uh, understanding, he thinks that this is very good. He's not allowed to just, I mean, spread that understanding. He he's asked to write to the caliph, to the leadership, who is the divinely leadership. If he permits, only then it could be, it could go to the people. Otherwise, might be the person, he thinks something good, but it may be wrong. So that's the check and balance in the Muslim community. So we are actually the true representation of Islam, although at this time, Muslim world, they do not uh, uh, acknowledge this, we don't care, because it always happened that those people who come from God, they are not, people do not uh, make a bed of roses for them, they have to go through that hard times. I can, you can name any prophet, any messenger of God. I can give you the life of the prophet Abraham, Noe, Moses, Jesus, prophet Muhammad. They all went through those hard shifts. And we, the Ahmadiyya Muslim community, who was founded according to the prophecies of the prophet Muhammad, how it could be that once a uh, Muslim friend, I was explaining to him, sorry, I take too much time, but, <laughs> and he said that how it could be that you, if it is prophesied that the Messiah, when he'll come, he will spread peace. Because the Prophet Muhammad, he said that when he will come, at, during his time, the religious wars will be stopped. They will not be allowed. And he said that if you proclaim that that Messiah has come and he has spread message, why you didn't bring that much change in the world uh, after 125 years? I told him, the response is, that God does not change his laws to, to implement his plan. He has made the laws. I asked him, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, who was the, who was the greatest prophet, he was a Khatam and a he came 1400 years ago. Still, his message is not reached as it should be across the world because the divine message takes its course. Similarly, as a, a God created the universe, a child uh, brings in this, comes in this world, yeah, yeah. he takes time to, I mean, so the natural phenomena, natural time, this community will face, but we are overcoming those hurdles, and God willing, our efforts are there, and uh, with, the, with, the, with the divine blessing of Allah Ta'ala, the God Almighty, there will, be, there will come a change. We are certain. We have a final question, a final question from the gentleman there, we could be brief. Uh, but one, could you clarify one thing for the question John made? Mm -hmm. uh, if I believe from what I read that the, lead, the leader, world leader of the Ahmadiyya, it's based in London. Yes. See, it's not even based in an Arab country. Oh. Based in London. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for your interesting talk. I found the Ahmadiyya interpretation um, quite persuasive, actually. And you talk a lot about tolerance. But uh, perhaps um, if I could take this a bit further, um, here in Malta, in the Muslim schools, um, Obviously, you're, you're teaching tolerance in your religion. Um, does it include in your curriculum information on other religions, like the Christian religion? Um, and what aspect is tolerance taught in, in your schools? I mean, I, uh, firstly, I'm not, uh, uh, because uh, we are not part of that uh, school organization. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know, I, I personally do not know what the syllabus is all about. But in... Uh, our schools, in our children, we do teach them other religions. We do teach them comparative studies of different religions. Even myself, when I studied Islam, I did not study just Islam and became Imam. I studied all the major religions of the world. Not just, I mean, have a book and that, thoroughly, deeply. So in our community, and we also encourage our youth, our children, to engage in discussions with other religious uh, students. Because other Muslims, uh, if you talk to them, they all, mostly they tell their children, do not talk to that person, do not talk to Ahmadiyya, do not talk to this. And we encourage our children and our youth, you must talk to others. You must engage in dialogue. But without you talk to others, how would you understand each other? So we, in our Ahmadiyya community, the approach is different. And that is approach what the Quran and the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, 
he has taught us. That's why once a delegation from Najran, a Christian delegation, came to the, uh, for, for a dialogue with him, that dialogue took place in the, in the mosque of the Prophet. And while at the time when there was time of the prayer, the Christian delegation wanted to get out. And the uh, Prophet asked, why do you want to go out? They said, because it's our prayer time and we would like to go out and pray. And then we'll return back and then we'll again engage in the, in the discussion. He said, why do you want to go out? This is the house of God. Pray here. He spared the place and the Christian delegation, they prayed inside the mosque of the Prophet according to the Christian customs and traditions. So that's what Islam is all about. It's Islam is not that uh, building walls. Absolutely not. That's the distorted uh, picture of Islam. What Islam I have learned from the Prophet Muhammad and the Holy Quran, that Islam is peace, that Islam is love, that Islam is accepting each other, that Islam is Islam of brotherhood. And we, we wish and we, are, we believe that in our lifetime we see that the whole world becomes one great family. We live in peace, we live in harmony. I mean, through fighting, through centuries we are fighting and we did not reach to any positive conclusion. The only conclusion for our problems, the remedy to our issues is dialogue, understanding, tolerance and giving space to each other. And I wish we find the world becoming a haven of peace during our lifetime. Like, I, th I, think, I think that's a lovely thought for us to end. Thank you. Uh, we've been very faithful to the time. I said that my email will stop at quarter to nine. Uh, I thank Like for the, all the material he's produced, far more than I thought uh, you know, would be available. It's a pity that we've run out of time, Like, but you know, having established this uh, relationship now, I think we should do, continue our efforts to understand one another more. Uh, certainly the Ahmadiyya, from what I've read, uh, is totally different to a lot of what we read about the Muslim religion. Thank you very much again. By Thank the way, you for like got to know, and I realized, I didn't know how we got to know, he sent me an email yesterday saying, I understand that in the Millennium Chapel, you need a, another clothes rack. And he actually presented Father Hillary with another rack. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. Thanks.